So with that, I'm going to bring up our next set of speakers, and this is actually one of my favorite topics, um, is the invisible bins. And this is how we describe our reduction and reuse categories. Um, and I was trying to describe it to a client years ago, and one of their colleagues said, they're invisible. Um, so this is where the power is. It's where the money is made and saved, and this is how we transform it. So I'm going to introduce our moderator, um, Miss Angela Howe with Surfrider Foundation, and we've been um, fighting plastic for many, many years and working with Angela through the Clean Seas Coalition, and I've had the pleasure of also spending some personal time out hiking with her children and her, her dog and, and really enjoying uh, why we do this. So with that, I'm going to bring up Angela, and Angela can bring up the intro slides and the um, um, in her presentation. So hopefully we have Angela on deck. Yes. Hello. Great. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> hey, Stephanie. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. Yeah, we need to go on another hike soon. So <laughs> um, yes, well, I was just going to introduce our panel. So metrics and tools for the invisible bins, reduce and reuse. So when you reduce, you're using less of something or you reuse something so you don't need to create waste you have an invisible bin to put all of that uncreated waste in. And I love the title as well. Um, and welcome all to the panel. Hopefully we'll have a good discussion on how to increase those invisible bins. Um, and Stephanie, I don't think I got your uh, intro slides, but I can just make intros if that's okay. Sure, I'll try and bring them up while you're introducing, oh, but uh, go ahead. Sure, well, our, our esteemed panelists include Sue Beats Atkinson and Dr. Nadare Afsharmanish. And um, first I'll introduce uh, Sue. Uh, I know she was helping moderate the last panel, um, but Sue is Global Vice President of Sustainability at SBM Management. Um, she's a Senior Director of Sustainability for SBM Site Services with over 25 years of solid waste management and recycling experience. Uh, Beats Atkinson was a key player in the founding of solid waste management programs for a large computer manufacturer in the United States, a program which yielded 91.2% diversion nationally back in 2005 when this was unheard of. And a little bit after that, Sue and I were on the founding board of directors for the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council, which Stephanie has now led uh, to true zero waste. So it's been great to work with Sue. I know she's an absolute leader in the field. And there is her more full bio. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and then uh, Dr. Nadare F. Sharmanesh. Thank you. Um, she's Vice President of Sustainability and Education at ECOS, um, which is Earth Friendly, -friendly Products. Uh, Nadare has been at the helm of ECOS um, sustainability efforts and leading four facilities to be platinum certified by True Zero Waste. And their New Jersey facility just this week won the Governor's Award for excellence, environmental excellence. Um, so really uh, at the forefront of um, uh, greening facilities, which is wonderful. I think we have a lot of great lessons to be learned from Nattery. Um, So with that, I think I was going to do a few intro slides if I can, um, or slides um, just from Surfrider, if I can share my screen um, and talk about uh, just a few things that we do and really, um, what I specialize in is uh, plastic pollution legislation. So keeping these metrics and um, understanding how much you're you know, reusing and reducing is really important. And it may be more and more important with uh, legislation in the coming years. So, um, so an introduction for me, I'm the legal director for Surfrider Foundation. Um, I've been with Surfrider about 14 years and it's a grassroots environmental conservation organization really focused on the coast and uh, protection and enjoyment of the ocean waves and beaches. So we do beach cleanups. And what do we find on our beach cleanups is plastic. And that's really created this um, uh, groundswell of advocacy over the last decade and a half and advocacy to reduce plastic pollution at the source. So that's what some of the um, legislation I'm gonna talk about today entails, time check. So I think we kind of know this, uh, plastic pollution is the largest source of uh, trash found in the ocean. Um, 11 million metric tons of plastic pollution end up in the ocean every year. Um, Oceana uh, calculated that out and found out that it was a 
equivalent to a dump truck, a, uh, dumping a garbage truck of plastic, full of plastic into the ocean every minute of the day. So just this immense amount is, is getting into our ocean and, and ruining our marine resources. Um, so equivalent of 90 aircraft carriers um, in 2010, uh, we know larger plastics uh, can damage or harm marine life um, just by manipulating their habitat, but also they can ingest it or get entangled, especially in nets. But really what's what we're getting a lot more information on and is uh, becoming very concerning to scientists and activists alike is uh, the small microplastics and what that's doing to the food chain. Um, uh, you know, not only how it's harming fish, marine life, uh, plants and animals, but also the humans that ingest them. So a little bit more, this is just giving a graphic for the amount of, of waste uh, that's being generated. And a lot of it's coming from America. So 320 million metric tons produced in 2016. So this is the amount of um, uh, plastic waste would be the equivalent to the weight of 9.7 million male African elephants. So you see that little 0.7 baby elephant on the top, which I always give credit to our, our great graphic designer, Katie Klan, for, for putting that together. Um, so let's what's the legislation to, to fix this? We've been doing so much over the past 10 years. Um, you know, I think Stephanie and I worked back in the day on the California bag ban, but there's been a lot more since then. Um, it, what we're going to see in California this upcoming year is the uh, 2022 ballot initiative. Um, and this was bumped from 2020. Uh, basically, the pandemic was interfering with signature collections. But this is going to be a very comprehensive package um, that requires all products to be reusable, recyclable, and compostable by 2030. So products and packaging. They want packaging to be reduced and recyclable. So um, single use packaging and foodware reduced by 25% by 2030. So that's a reduction goal. We haven't seen that in other legislation. And then another novel concept is up to one cent fee per item um, on producers for single use packaging and foodware. Uh, and this would all go into a California plastic pollution reduction fund, helping the environment, uh, environmental justice um, and waterways with that fund. Many, many different great things have done with that fund. And just to review this past year, 2021, um, the California legislator, legislature did a lot of great things. I'm gonna cover four bills, but they actually passed over six bills um, targeted at plastic pollution. And um, one was, I think we all know, like you have your junk drawer and you get to go uh, food and then you fill it up with uh, plastic utensils and just stuff you don't need, you know, extra napkins wrapped in plastic and, um, really getting rid of that. A lot of times during the pandemic, we were just getting food to go to take it home and eat it, which we'd probably like to do on a real plate with real silverware. So you didn't need all that to go where. Um, so this is requiring that people request a um, that to go where and request, it's similar to the straw legislation. Also a really important one for um, recycling portfolio, AB 881. Uh, mixed plastic waste export reform. It closes a loophole that enables mixed plastic waste to be deemed recycled, even though it's being shipped to non-OECD countries um, that are either landfill burned or, or dumped. So just they don't have the recycling infrastructure to handle it. And this complements an earlier assembly joint resolution uh, targeted the same thing, more that international environmental justice concept. A couple more that passed, truth in recycling labeling. So this really addresses the chasing arrows. You can't put those on things that aren't recycl recyclable, which currently is not a law and it is very confusing for customers. Um, and then uh, just allowing a returnable bottle um, system. So, so creates a system for refillables, not just a CRV, a bottle bill, where you, you take the aluminum back, you melt it down and create a new can. This is you know getting glass bottles back, cleaning them, not mechanically breaking them down, but cleaning them and reusing them, which we actually did in the past and we see in other countries, but went out of practice in, in California. And then something that turned into a two-year bill and did not pass was the uh, e-commerce bill, which phases out plastic films in e-commerce, um, covers mailers and polystyrene peanuts, those things you shouldn't have that create waste um, in the new online economy that we, we are all immersed in. 
And then finally, uh, one big thing from, from Maine, they were the first state to become, um, to pass a extended producer responsibility law for packaging. So we've seen these laws for batteries and for carpets, um, but not for packaging. Um, and this requires DP to start the rulemaking process in 2023. So we're really gonna see how that plays out over the next couple of years um, and creates a stewardship organizations where basically the producers are have a fee for what they're creating and then um, will give that back to the municipalities that are taking it and recycling it and managing that waste. So really exciting law. We're seeing that pop up a lot of other places around the country um, and just showing what's, what's probably coming down down the pike and uh, the rest of the nation. So um, that's just a flavor for legislation. Like, like I said, I'll stop my screen share now and I would be happy to pass it on to, I believe Sue, you're going next. I am going next. Hi, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Oh, goodness. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to talk about what doesn't exist, but really does exist which is harder to divert and track. So that's where I was gonna go with this. I, I strongly feel that there are options for us and sometimes we just, we try and overcomplicate how to track uh, what doesn't exist. And so the EPA uses the term to mean any action undertaken to eliminate or reduce the amount or taxivity of materials before they enter the municipal solid waste stream. Reuse is a type of waste prevention. Waste prevention is a type of waste prevention. It's a, a circle that we have going on. And so if we look at this, what are the things that we generate that we could change? So um, I wanna say Joni talked about um, food waste and the containers that they use. And so, you know, is there you know, we can go from a disposable container, which COVID has created billions of these, to a compostable container that I can put in a compost program to a durable good that I can no longer generate either a disposable or a compostable, but someone is now washing the dishes. And so there's a lot of different ways to look at this. And it even gets a little tricky with the fact that a reduction can sometimes be reuse. So you've got to identify as a business how you want to handle that. And so um, that is a lot about where the program goes and who's involved. I can't get this bar removed. Let's see if I can move it there. It goes. And so as you're looking at your waste streams, and this is, this is part of, of true and zero waste, is always start with the highest and best use. How do I eliminate that? How do I get that source reduction? And, and Stephanie mentioned, this is the best place for us to try and save money. Um, we know that recycling is, has gotten much more expensive to run through a process. We know that landfill is the bread and butter of the waste companies. But as we work on our way to the top and the most preferred, how do we look at these things and what's involved? And it gets even trickier that if I'm a company that's working on a reduction goal, me adding more material in does not help my goals. So there's a way that, that True has evaluated that process. Let's see if I can get this to go. So when you're looking at your diversion and you're looking at reuse, you're able to track that. And you're able to look at reuse as quantifiable items. So the simplest thing I think is pallets. So if you can set up a process to either reuse wood pallets or reuse plastic pallets, and you actually document that process, you are showing value to your operation, both in weight and the potential dollars to track this. And so you know, the simple thing of looking at this is trash, land, filler, waste, and energy. They are all the same in, in this viewpoint. I have recycled diversion weight, I have reuse weight, and I add them up, and I have an uh, overall goal. Now, if I add reduction to the program, I'm actually adding to the overall weight. 
And so what we've created is either, and you can call it anything you want, but what we're doing is putting this below what your original diversion line was. And because of that reason, you're not adding to or making worse your reduction goals. That's a key part of this. It still changes your diversion because as I add to my reduction, I am able to increase my overall program. And you can see that the weight has gone up from 129 to 144. And so I'm gonna put give a few more examples of this as we work through it. And if you want, we can definitely talk through this or ask questions as we move along. If you look at the true certification, you must track the actual diversion, including a reduction plus the zero waste diversion. That's get you, that helps increase your score. So the requirement is you must um, reduce at least one material. You collect documentation. So if I'm a pal working on a pallet company, my documentation might state that we're starting a reuse program. That reuse program requires all pallets to criteria, right? No broken boards, no missing stringers at the top, no nails sticking up because that's a safety concern. And then you've got to create that methodology of how I'm going to track that. We're doing this for a client right now. And the documentation is that, number one, we're going to identify what is acceptable in reuse. Number two, we're going to document how that shipping and receiving department's going to handle this material. So they've actually used painter's tape on a wall, identified 10 pallets tall. And every time they move 10 pallets, they put one mark on the sheet. Now, in that documentation, we've identified an average weight of those wood pallets. So we can apply that to the 10 pallets that they're reusing. We do this on a monthly basis that they will send a picture of their sheet and we add that to their diversion report. Some places do it on a quarterly basis. The other thing I like in that documentation is how much does that pallet cost if I'm buying a new one? I'm saving them money. And that helps reinforce you might even be able to afford, after showing them that dollar savings, the sorting of pallets, all of the pallets versus a simpler approach. So documentation, methodology, adding that to your program and maintaining it. You can do this forever and track that, that diversion that you've created. So I mentioned pallets. There's many, many different ways that you can look at this, whether that's grass cycling, pallets, um, office reuse, durable goods. There's, there's quite a plethora of things that you might have not taken advantage of because, well, that's a lot of math. But if you can figure out the basics of it, it really helps things. So I mentioned the pallet reuse. You know, it's as simple as number of pallets, what your average weight is, that gives you the tons. You add your cost per pallet, cost per ton to the landfill. I always include avoided disposal cost. If you would have paid a waste hauler to take your pallets and now you're not doing that, money talks in these programs and it helps you quantify what you're doing. Here's an example of reduction tracking of dual printing. Also a true credit that you want to document in the simplest way that I've done it is uh, we order from Staples. And so how many cases did I order from Staples of paper the previous year and how many did I order this year? I do that as an annual number. I don't go through all of the work of document, documenting that on a monthly number, but it works no matter what. In addition, now this one I think is a critical one and it has huge volumes associated. This is about durable goods. Now by durable goods, you've got to evaluate your program. One of our clients did an absolutely fabulous job converting the entire cafeteria into durable goods. I went to take a Danish to the airport with me and there were no to-go containers, not a single one it was wrapped in a napkin. So that's the way that we want to do this. That, that's just absolutely motivating. I've got goosebumps. But with this, it is a matter of documenting not only what the process is, where it's located. So in this building, they did go above and beyond and created all of these durable options. They have coffee cups. They have uh, lids, they have silverware, they have plates, they have bowls. They even went to um, putting all of the, the, um, the salt and the sugar and the equal and all of those into a larger container 
so that you are just using that instead of packets. It's just a phenomenal way to look at the program. And again, it's about documenting what's happening and then tracking it. So what we did is we worked with the, the um, cafeteria team to identify, number one, everything that they were doing. The first thing that we did is worked with, when I order something, they are able to track those to-go dishes. So if I ordered food and it's either on a plate, it's in a bowl, I've got a coffee cup or a mug or a water cup and then silverware. And so what we did is we established what that average disposal weight was, and it was 1.25 ounces. They were able to track every meal to go, and every month they would give us this number, and we would multiply it out so that we knew how many ounces, pounds, tons was generated by not generating a product. This is all durable goods. They are being washed. You know, you've got to pick your battles on whether you worry about water usage and reusables versus disposables and compostables. But then we actually went into the cost per meal for these containers because we wanted to know what is the estimated cost for maintaining these. So actually we were able to show an $11,700 savings for one month. Large site, don't get me wrong on that. We did take into account the cost to landfill as well as the savings that were a part of the disposables. Now in doing this, we did a lot of legwork. We had to weigh every single item. We had to look at what the difference was uh, from a durable to a compostable. And then we documented how the process was gonna work. And that's the key to this is, how do I figure out what that meal looks like and how many pounds I'm generating? And we made assumptions. You always have to. And then we documented all of that. And so, with that said, the, I think the most important part of everything that we do is about documentation. How do we document it? What's involved? And I try and invite, invite as many people as I can that can talk through the process so that I might have my one viewpoint, but what is your viewpoint? What do you see as the waste? And we even went so far as to weigh all the boxes of the compostables that were there because you have a box. You have a wrapper on all of those coffee cups, if you, if you think about it. So how are you gonna document it? What's involved in the documentation? Who needs to be involved? You know, they, were, they, they actually stopped doing this because of COVID and we keep checking in. So COVID's almost gone except this third variant. When do we get to start again? You know, and we're excited about that. And the more we can excite everybody else about it, gets it moved back in faster. And then what certifications are you really looking at? Are you looking at lead? Are you looking at true? What's involved for you? And I mentioned grass cycling. And this is one of the, the things that we miss. You know, I believe, and I've, I've worked for a lot of businesses for a lot of years, when there is money, a lot of these businesses feel that they need to pick up the grass and leave, you know, they don't leave the grass on the lawn. And one of the first things that I try and communicate is there is nothing wrong with leaving all that nutrients in the grass. Now what we need to do is track it. And the Cal EPA, excuse me, calrecycle.org has got um, a website that you just grass cycling and it'll give you the formulas. It helps you explain the process and what's involved. And some of that means that we've just got to bring in those people that are a part of this to talk through the process. And I bet a large part of these businesses that are on this call are already doing this and you're not taking advantage. So, you know, you've got to get a letter from the landscaper. How many acres? How often do you mow? Do you mow on a, we're in California. Do you mow every single month? Do you mow every week? And you've got to put all those calculations into this. But it really is a great program. It's, it's a missed opportunity, in my opinion. But again, you've got to document what you're doing, a letter from your landscaper or whoever's doing the mowing um, and the process. So, uh, key takeaways. I think discovery is a really important part of this. You know, walking those facilities and identifying the different waste streams that you're generating and why. Um, I work for a janitorial company. So SBM is not sous vide management. It is summer's building maintenance and we're a janitorial company, global janitorial company. And so that discovery is what are we generated? Um, quickly, because I think I have a few minutes. We went and I analyzed what 
our chemicals come in, our toilet papers and paper towels. And in the past, toilet paper would come in a box and it would have a liner inside it. You'd have a wrapper on every roll of toilet paper. And unless you're composting those rolls of toilet paper, that wrapper is too thin for us to recycle. So it's going into the landfill. Now you're seeing coreless toilet paper. It's almost thick enough for two full rolls. It comes in a shrink wrap container. The bad news is it is blue, so it needs to be clear to make it easier to recycle, but we've eliminated the wrapper, we've eliminated the cardboard box. And so how do we work with every single vendor? And this is what Mary is talking about. How do we get rid of the, the wrappings that we don't need? And then quantify them. Document your process, document dates, who's involved. I keep names out of it, we leave job descriptions in there. And then keep it as simple as possible, apples to apples analogies. Uh, with that, I am done and I'm going to hand it off to Natter A. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. Every time I, I listen to Sue and, and, and uh, Stephanie and the rest of you, I learn something new. <laughs> it's just, I'm so grateful. Um, okay, I just have to figure out how to share my screen. Yes, Natara. So at the bottom, there's a green arrow that says share screen. Yes. And while Natara is bringing that up, I love the discussion that's happening. Just keep it going. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to know who's out there. And there you go, Natara. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to join um, these uh, presentations, and I'm so grateful to know all your uh, all of you um, knowledgeable people. I learn um, a lot every time I, I meet you. A um, little bit about the company. Earth Friendly Products is a, a privately owned uh, company. We have four facilities across the U.S., New Jersey, California, Illinois, and Washington. All four facilities are carbon neutral, water neutral, and platinum zero waste certified. We are in the process of getting our net zero certifications, lead net zero certifications. So um, with that, um, I have a few things to share with all of you because it's a manufacturing uh, facilities. There are certain challenges that we have been facing and I can, I can hear it from everyone. On, um, and asking the question on how we were able to achieve, you know, our goals and, and so on. So I'm happy to share with you. Um, zero waste was part of our carbon neutrality program because we started uh, measuring and managing our scope one, two, and three and waste um, and, and end of life of our products or, or manufacturing process was part of the big picture that we need to take into consideration in order to measure our carbon footprint and, and um, eliminate or minimize it as much as possible. Um, sustainability altogether is part of our DNA and we try to integrate it in er every aspect of the, of the business. And we, our goal is, you know, from, uh, one-sided, you know, getting materials into our facilities and, and get rid of it, uh, kind of that it used to be or still is unfortunately out of sight, out of mind. We try to bring it back to the system and, and make sure that we minimize our waste as much as possible. Um, again, sustainability is, is integrated in, into our uh, manufacturing process. Um, every department has its own guideline and um, directions and goals and follow through. Everyone is responsible and held accountable for what, with, uh, what, they, are, what they are doing and what's happening in their um, department. So what I do is I make sure that I have enough communication and, and through meetings, emails or whatever else, however that they, they need to contact me and touch base with them catch up with them on a regular basis. And at the end of the year, I spread out all the uh, achievements, share it with the team and set the goal for the following year. Um, one thing that um, is, is um, you know, differentiating us from many guidelines applies to everyone from CEO um, to 
um, executive, C-suite, office, um, plant managers, uh, staff, production, visitors, janitors, everyone. Once we say there is no um, styrofoam um, should be you know, used at the facility, it applies to everyone. And that's very important. It's, it's like um, you cannot expect your team to do something when you are contradicting with behaving something else. So sharing that responsibility between all aspects of our, or every department, that's very important. And even, you know, again, executives, even when they arrive and I, and I can see that, you know, probably they are maybe confused or they don't know how to deal with certain materials. We have a meeting and make sure that they are leading the team and they are becoming a, a mentor for their team members. Um, all, you know, all the um, approach or, or uh, you know, strategies to deal with, with waste from reducing, reusing, redesigning, rethinking, and everything is, uh, you know, is part of the solution that um, we need to think and, and follow through. A uh, little bit about our success story. Back in 2009, our diversion was 10% across all four facilities. By 2016, we maintain our 95% diversion. This year, we were able to achieve up to 98% diversion across all four facilities. And, and our facilities are full on production environment. So we um, have our laboratories to test the products, we pack it um, and, and deliver. So the four, four, the four facilities are identical. Um, this can visualize how or, uh, or you know, what did 95% diversion uh, look like. Back in 2009, um, we had 20 trash bins per week. So it is four industrial trash bins collected five days a week. Cost was about $1,800 a month back then. By 2013, we reduced it down to one three cubic yard um, trash bin. And since we have started our composting program, we minimize it down to two cubic yard. And this is a facility about maybe 80 to 95 or 100, depends on production load of, of the staff working five to six days a week. And the cost is significantly less. Um, little bit about um, our incentives because we thought um, the staff needs some kind of a support system to make sure that they, it's not just during working hours, but also they, they um, take that culture and mentality to their community and to their family. So we uh, implement a number of uh, incentives to our staff. So we pay $2,000 um, if they purchase eco-friendly car, $2,500 if it is more than $45, uh, mile per gallon, $1,000 re relocation incentive, $2,000 if they install solar panels at their residential, and we are considering other incentives for coming year. Um, here, um, again, I'm, I'm uh, you know, presenting a few things that we have started to implement, eliminating disposable cutleries, um, styrofoam, con styrofoam containers and uh, disposable water bottles. And again, this guideline, this, these guidelines apply to everyone. So no matter the position, it will be very odd that someone enters our, our building with any of these materials. Um, Zero waste and any, I want to say it applies to any sustainability uh, initiatives is a behavioral change. We need um, to start from changing the mentality and culture of a company, of a community or a society and so on. Consistency is very important. And, um, and, and I, I totally understand when it is so challenging and you go back to work and you see, my God, everything is falling apart. And, you know, no one is following through. It's so natural and it does happen. Um, but consistency and, and have the passion of 
getting through and, and maintain your, your achievements is very important and you need a, a good uh, support team. And responsibility is back to everyone. So all team leaders, executives, line leaders, supervisors, everyone is, uh, you know, should and, and, and uh, equals are held accountable for um, what's happening in their team. Education, education, education is a never ending story. It's educating um, our staff, um, consumers, community, vendors. We just completed a sustainability training for our suppliers um, a few days ago. Um, and they are in a different level of knowledge. Some of them are really good and they already started their program. Some of them, they don't even know where to start. So we always to try to provide resources for them and, and support them, but there is a expectation and there is a standard that we, I, mean, I personally refuse to um, eliminate it because it's um, doable. If you really care and you want to keep the business going, um, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't take that much of an effort to join and, and, and follow through. We do educate our staff, and this is part of my uh, um, you know, presentation or, or educational program for our staff. I want to make sure that everyone understands you know, the, our impact on earth is not just local, it's not just national, it is international, it's global. And you know, what, you know, what happens somewhere in China or what have you eventually adds, you know, impacts us as well and vice versa. So this is one of the presentations that I prepared, you know, the impact of, um, you know, our, our waste and what we order from overseas, even we don't see the manufacturing impact, but it's happening and, and everyone is responsible for whatever impact um, is, you know, is affecting those communities. And this is a part of the carbon footprint that we are trying to follow through and, and make sure that we minimize it not only within our facilities, but also from overseas and our supply chain. Something that I want to point out to our uh, team is the impact of especially waste on um, land and um, you know the impact on our health and well-being as well. And this pattern, you can see it in many uh, countries. This is a specifically from a study done in China. You can see on the left that um, uh, you know, shows the uh, pollution and the location of manufacturing, as well as the you know, um, undeniable impact on health and well-being of that community. And you can see the cluster of cancer villages on, on the side of the region that mostly are industrial and, and there are lots of pollution because of the um, uh, existence of, of those wastes um, in the community. Um, this is another uh, presentation that I just prepared for uh, uh, the Recycle Day. And I always want to point out uh, to our team that recycling is the last option, not, not the best, best option. And the best day ever would be the, the time that we upcycle our, our baler because we, ha we have already redesigned, reduced, reused everything in, in advance that there is not much need to recycle. And I want everyone to know that recycling by the time something is ready to recycle, the damage is done. So let's just start beforehand. That's one of the things that I want um, everyone to notice. So rethinking, reducing, uh, repairing, and everything in between um, need to come first. And then if there, is, if there is no solution, you are left with either landfill or recycle. Obviously, we want to recycle. This is another thing that um, I do. Um, on a regular basis, um, one day I arrived at uh, work and I noticed that there was a plastic uh, bag full of um, carrots um, in our compost bin. Somehow someone tried to um, do the right thing and compost those carrots. So what I do, that's my usual practice. I have a, a little table. I 
you know, spread out materials that are not in the right place. And I point out, you see, what is what needs to be done and how to be correctly sorted. And I leave that those materials for a few days so people notice it, people ask questions. And that's one of the strategies how to um, educate and, and, you know, um, make sure that we are all on the same page on sorting things correctly. Obviously, rethinking comes first. Prevention is, is uh, extremely important before it comes to the problem that we don't know what to do with it. And we need to make more effort in order to divert materials from landfill. Recycling is the last option. And, you know, if, you know, something needs to be disposed of, uh, there is no other way around it. Um, these are um, ideas that we started at Earth Friendly Products. The pallets are being repaired, uh, saving about $4,000 a year. Um, we made um, pallet gardens at our uh, California facility. Um, again, um, just trying to reuse those broken pallets and bookshelves. These are just examples of the things that we have started and uh, currently use at our facilities. Um, mindset of how we can do something right before it ends up as a problem. Um, behavioral change, everyday practices, these are the keys that you need to take into consideration. Um, everyone have their own way of dealing with uh, um, uh, their everyday responsibility. People are busy, but just, you know, just a little bit of effort of changing a mindset whether I need a, um, you know, individual uh, printer in my office or I can share with my colleagues, that little step um, goes a long way. Um, again, reusing our uh, boxes, you can see that we use those boxes at our facilities as a, a divider and um, small changes, one step at a time, one department at a time, at a time, uh, it, it, you know, before you know it, everyone is sharing. And this actually came from one of our production staff. The idea came from one of our production staff. Um, we tried uh, uh, to also impact and change or improve our products as well. So we are moving forward to um, bring, and you, can, you, you have seen it in the market, those uh, sheets, this is the laundry sheets that eliminating water, eliminating plastic. So they do, those sheets are um, laundry detergents that um, can be used um, and there is no plastic um, in that um, product. We are also considering um, a loop a program that we are reusing and uh, kind of, bringing the uh, uh, bottles or that container into the system and refill it. Three uh, challenges that I usually notice, employees engagement, cost, and senior management support. Um, it's a teamwork. Everyone needs to be on board. Everyone needs to have their own share and, and held accountable. That's extremely important. And we all learn together. It's not like, um, hidden behind the desk or, or a team leader is hidden behind the desk, they need to be part of the solution. For employees engagement, obviously um, you may start with a small group of passionate people and it takes a lot of effort. And I totally understand that sometimes it's so difficult, but you, know, you can start from two or five or any number. After a while, you probably see few people uh, lose interest, but never mind. you start again, every day is a new day and um, try to share um, your success and challenges and, and being all ears also important to make sure that they communicate their challenges. Um, that brings a lot of um, motivation to the team. The cost, Sue uh, touched on that really greatly. So I, you know, I, every, every time I learn a lot from her. So she already mentioned about calculations and everything that you can do beforehand and the ROI is very quick. Uh, and also uh, knowing that you need to shop around all the time. There are new businesses, new uh, reg uh, regulations. There are all different ways of dealing with things. So it's not one size fit all or something is sitting, sitting there. Uh, you know, every year we um, 
sit down and, and find out how we can eliminate the cost and so on. But um, doing your math is very important. Uh, leadership uh, for uh, us at ECOS, leadership is, is very important. Every team leader needs to be a mentor and help the team and give them the support that they need. You, there is no way that you can um, expect a team on their own without support of the team leader. So uh, leadership is, is extremely important. And um, we do have our sustainability scorecard for everyone uh, to ensure that team leaders are supporting um, their staff in order to uh, um, achieve their goals. Uh, this, these are, uh, you know, this, this uh, slide shows how we put all the factors together, customers, educating our customers, working with the community, all employees are, um, uh, you know, part of the solution. We work with our suppliers, we select the suppliers that share the sh same vision with us. So that's um, extremely important to bring the supply chain into the discussion. Um, we um, work, as I mentioned, with our suppliers. Our procurement team um, have a very uh, important role in order to pinpoint the materials that are uh, using less packaging, more sustainable. The team needs to be um, uh, educated and trained to be able to work with the suppliers and, and select the suppliers that work with us. So all the things, you know, uh, selecting the materials that come into the gate um, is a bigger factor rather than once in the gate and you purchase it and you don't know what to do with it. Um, one success story, um, we were trying to find out how to, uh, to uh, recycle our disposable gloves. These are gloves that can, need to be used and need to be, um, you know, ex, you know um, uh, kind of reused in a way that, um, you know, in, in order to eliminate uh, contamination. So um, what we did, we found a, a recycling center in, somewhere in, in Illinois, but the, the problem was that they only accept one particular brand and that brand is very expensive in the market. So um, we, approached the, uh, the vendor and asked for a, a discount and, and you know, a better pricing. Um, so with that, we were able to save about $9,000 a year to purchase a brand that we were able to recycle at the end. So it took a lot of you know, effort, time, emails, phone calls, and all that, and negotiation but eventually we were able to establish and, and maintain that um, initiative. And yesterday, again, there was a discussion, people didn't know what to do and I had to explain the whole thing that this is part of the procurement and they can always find um, that particular brand in a market in order to, to be recycled. Um, okay, that's about it, the things that I'm done with my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. And Sue, what wonderful information! And the the chat was going off, so we have some good questions in our in our last nine minutes here. Um, and yeah, Nader, I think that was excellent. Um, how you talked about not only procurement and making your your facilities sustainable. I love the pallet garden, and but also the products. So I put on my shopping list the Ecos laundry sheets, and awesome. <laughs> that I think that's great. Innovation with products is is really needed, and um, there, it, there was actually one question that went more to, um, you know, we need uh, carrots for companies instead of sticks, you know, necessarily saying you're breaking the law if you do this, but what would be some good incentives um, for, you know, uh, where do I find more tax write-offs related to these diversions? I'd really like to work with the major hospitals in Austin to motivate them with money savings. And Stephanie Barger replied in the, tra in the chat that, Unfortunately, we don't have tax write-offs for reduction reuse right now. We need to get a federal law, but um, you know, there is a savings that you both pointed out. One person followed the question with, "How do you sell the the savings, the actuaries, to the C-suite on avoided costs as opposed to actual cost reduction?" 
Um, I didn't know if, if maybe either of you could speak to that, just your tips I, on uh, laser. I actually, sorry, Angela, my fault. I actually responded to that, that I, I think that we've all got to look at this. Um, there's a couple ways to look at it, right? So some businesses, and I've seen this happen, start and have a great program and the business wants to save money. So they stop doing all that work. That's the eye opener. I think that no one wants to go backwards at a very fast pace. But what it did is it, it immediately showed you needed to buy more compactors. You needed to have more equipment to take the trash away. And we were able to then quantify, actually we had all the numbers, but you're able to share that avoided disposal cost. And we've got to have a good story. And I think that every business has different managers, directions, goals, that you've got to sort of tweak that story to match what they need, right? I think that's an important part of this. I think the other part of this is, is knowing the math that you're, you're constantly quantifying it. And if you can get in front of your management team, even if it's not monthly, but quarterly, that you're showing your diversion goal to your corporate goal and the money you would have spent if you had nothing. I had a vendor, uh, excuse me, a business many, many years ago, 20 plus, that had a fabulous program, but every month I felt that we were fighting to keep it going. And so you've just got to find that, what motivates that level of management? And it changes. Natalie, how about you? Absolutely, I, I have to echo that as well. Uh, do, uh, the dollar sound, uh, sign speaks. So once you do your math and show the ROI, we were able to uh, pay off our brand new, new bailer in 11 months. At the beginning was a cost about, you know, I think it was $15,000 or so, but within 11 months, because of the reduction that we did in waste uh, collection, we were able to pay it off and the rest was ROI. Uh, we were able to save over $400,000 because of the fact that we minimize all the waste or the materials that we didn't need to purchase in the first place, to reuse materials, to repair all those materials, $4,000 saving on repairing those pallets. ROI is very quick, but you need to do that dollar sign to attract the, you know, the attention of the C-suite and, and executives. And I believe you me, it speaks loudly and it shows very quickly. Totally agree. The dollar signs first and foremost. Of course, there's a huge PR value too. I mean, you can talk about this, about how great your company is doing. Um, is it pretty it's a little more intangible. What's that? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, another question uh, that we had in the chat uh, uh, for textile waste. So I'm not sure if, if you guys work on this at all, but local governments don't have act accurate numbers on textile waste because it's diverted to the global South from charities and thrift stores thrift donations. How do we address this at the local level without the proper landfill numbers since we dump it onto other countries and don't take responsibility for repairing? So this is a little outside of, I know, my um, bailiwick, but I don't know if either of you guys know about the, the textile waste. We're working on that as a janitorial company that also mm -hmm. has logos on everything that we have, right? So you don't want those logos getting out. So I can't even donate them um, so we're finding companies that are actually shredding it and making it into a new product. What we found, though, is you've got to watch what you buy and what are the, the uh, plastics and what are the resins that are in your clothing and your textiles to determine how I can take it to the next level. The other thing that's interesting is tchotchkes, giveaways. You know, there's a lot of businesses that buy T-shirts and jackets and, you know, you name it, and they always buy too many. And then how do you get rid of them? So we're working on that. We've actually created a white paper on it. We're working with one of those very large software companies in the North, Northwest um, and doing a project on it. Because again, logos cannot be out. Um, it's a critical part. You don't ever want to see somebody with your logo sort of cleaning car windows for, for change. So you're always very careful. Um, one thing I, I, I don't consider it as a particular solution for now, but I, I would love to see a conference similar to this with all the recycling centers to come and, and speak and we share our you know, thoughts and challenges and hopefully they can help companies to come up with better solutions. I think um, we are falling behind with all this technology out there 
and we are just very primitively try to 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 deal with you know handful of materials there are so many things that we can do and the fear of losing the business is so great that people avoid going out of their comfort zone. What if my business you know, is not gonna uh, survive if there is no waste or there is no particular service? I'm sure there is a way to deal with it, but we need to help one another and work together, make a circular economy. It's just not the companies. We also need to bring more so, you know, factors into this discussion. Thank you both. Uh, well, we just have a couple of minutes. Oh, go ahead. If I could, Angela, uh, Rebecca mentioned in the chat, tomorrow they're actually talking about textile recycling. So that's a good plug for tomorrow. Perfect. Um, and let's just end with one question. Uh, which has more value, redesign, reduction, reuse, and diversion of those? Redesign, no. Yeah, I agree completely. I had to go through the list. Redesign is before anything end up in a place that you need to find a solution is the best way to approach it. I mean, the material that is already in the best, most efficient way of minimizing materials and being able to re re-enter the uh, system in a way that you need to work and spend less money and energy in or you know to make it work. That is the best solution, and then then the rest of it, right? Um, that brings up the you know the problem with all these appliances or or you know iPhones or what have you. This is like every time you purchase a new one, everything comes with it, and redesign mm -hmm. is speaks loudly when you. you yeah, the designed obsolescence is something right? we have to get around, and that's what the that's California bills really thing. the ballot measures geared at. Well, I think we're at time, Sue, unless you want to add any final. Um, okay. No, thank you all for joining. Um, I put my LinkedIn in the chat if anybody wants to reach out or has questions or wants to chat about trash, always. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you all. Thanks for the robust no, chat and um, have a great rest of the day. I think Stephanie's going to lead us into break here. Excellent. Great. Thanks for having us. Once again, thank you uh, to Angela, Sue, and Natarae.